Well, let's bring in economist uh, Stephen Roach. He's the former chairman of Morgan Stanley Asia, is now a Yale University senior fellow. He's also the author of the new soon-to-be-released books, uh, Accidental Conflict, America, China, and the Clash of False Narratives. Stephen, it's always great to speak with you. Um, I don't want to make you opine on a specific company, but should a company, I mean, in, in thinking about what has gone on in China and thinking about what is going to be, do you think a company like an Apple should be worried? Should big, iconic U.S. companies be afraid for their businesses in China for, you know, retaliation reasons, for COVID lockdown reasons, all these different things that we've been talking about? Retaliation is certainly worth uh, thinking about, uh, Melissa, especially since the uh, the Biden administration um, a couple of weeks ago announced these extraordinarily draconian measures against um, uh, U.S. exports going to boost Chinese technology. And China has retaliated tit for tat on virtually everything we've done uh, since uh, 2018. And, you know, I wouldn't rule out uh, significant retaliation from this. But, you know, I, I just want to add one thing to, you know, the, the insights that you and your group were offering uh, along with Eunice. Um, I want you just to think about one name, not Xi Jinping, but a, a gentleman by the name of Wang Huning, H-U-N-I-N-G. He was reappointed as one of the top seven standing committee members of the Politburo. Why do I focus on him? He's the guy that created the ideological thrust of uh, Xi Jinping thought, the Chinese dream, and he's written the book on China's view of a declining America, which has urged the Chinese leadership uh, to uh, embrace the notion of conflict uh, with uh, the United States. He's 67 years old. He was rumored to be retiring. He, was, he didn't retire. He was elevated. He's most likely to become either the chairman of the National People's Congress or the chairman of the consultative, consultative uh, political group in, in China. He's a big deal in terms of driving what Xi Jinping is all about. He's the guy behind the scenes that has given uh, uh, the U.S. so many problems. And, and he was just promoted. And very few people are uh, focusing on that right now. Mr. Roach, you know, one of the things I've said and I've been concerned about is as Americans, we look at things through our lens, right? But the world's a much different place. And if your opponent is willing to lose battles to win wars and doesn't have a five-minute timeline but a 50-year timeline, that's a very difficult opponent to beat. That is the, that is the Chinese. Can you speak to that? Because I think everything we've been seeing over the last couple of years speaks to exactly that, willing to lose battles but playing the long game. Yeah, their, their concept of strategy is very, very different. Uh, their perspective is different. Xi Jinping has laid out uh, objectives to hit great power status by 2049, which would be the 100th uh, anniversary of the founding of uh, the PRC. Uh, and, you know, they've, they've taken a lot of strategic actions in terms of uh, their military, the power consolidation uh, politically, uh, and the shift back to um, uh, state control uh, to help um, uh, implement that strategy. So, you know, we're, we, we think very myopically. We do things uh, short term, uh, and it's a, a, a real disconnect in terms of uh, us against them with these two different strategic perspectives. How should uh, U.S. companies think about retaliation? Uh, or how should the United States think about retaliation in, in general? Um, could it be using the zero COVID policy to enact pain in, in I mean, parts of Guangzhou right now are, are shut down. <laughs> and that could really cause a problem because that's a factory center of China. Um, or, or should it be measures like the U.S. is taking when it comes to chips, uh, where it's a more formalized sort of uh, act by China? Look, Melissa, we, we fired a big shot here. Um, yeah. And this was... Um, you, you could argue, um, you know, uh, an initiative that we took. And so the next move here is not retaliation from us, but retaliation from China. And I think we need to take those risks very, very seriously. And I don't think China's going to do anything deliberately to hurt its own system. Uh, it will take actions that will be directed uh, at the United States. It could be, you know, anything from uh, you know, rare earths, which we need 
uh, for a lot of our own uh, products here to a number of other actions that uh, we are vulnerable in. But, you know, I, I would they, they've obviously had their hands full in dealing with this Congress over the past week. And we have yet to uh, fully see what they're going to do in response. But make no mistake, they're, they're going to definitely do something uh, in response to these export sanctions on uh, 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 aimed at strangling uh, their advanced technologies. Mr. Roche, it's Karen. Thanks for being on. You talked about this big shot across the bow the Biden administration made. Do you think they did the right thing? Well, uh, that's that's a, 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 a tough question, Karen. I mean, these are draconian measures, and for them to have um, done what they did, uh, you have to presume that they have deep intelligence that China is utilizing uh, this technology uh, not just for uh, aggressive uh, military actions, such as building. Uh, supersonic missiles, but also to undermine uh, American technology, which we view as being um, uh, emblematic of our future, the, the prosperity uh, of our nation. I would have to say that the evidence there is a lot sketchier than uh, Washington uh, leads you to believe. So we've gone very far uh, uh, over the bow here on uh, on this one. And let's just hope that we have the evidence to uh, validate uh, these actions, because these are extraordinarily uh, tough uh, measures aimed at truly at strangling Chinese technology. How do you, um, or, or if you were at Morgan Stanley still, Stephen, and you were advising a company whose time frame was five years, which is how long she has solidified his power, you know, his term, um, <laughs> how should a company view the growth trajectory over these next five years? Well, look, I think, you know, China will, will grow, Melissa, but I think, um, you know, if we're talking about, uh, you know, companies assessing uh, their risks of China exposure, uh, they better be working pretty hard on plan B here because no one knows, again, how China is going to uh, play these uh, types of actions uh, down the road. And just to presume that it's going to, you know, blow over now that the party Congress is behind us, and we'll go back to uh, the way it used to be, whatever that was. Uh, I think that is uh, uh, being a little bit uh, too blasé about potential risk. We are in a serious conflict. We've gone in, in five years, we've gone from a trade war to a full-blown tech war to the early stages of a cold war. And so I, I wrote this book called Accidental Conflict with this in mind. When, you, when you're on this path of conflict, escalation, it doesn't take much of a spark to turn it into something far worse. And we got plenty of sparks right now. Just think back at what happened in the Taiwan Straits uh, in early August. So, you know, we're at a point of, of danger and mm -hmm. Xi Jinping, you know, filled with power um, uh, and, you know, with his buddy Wang Huning, uh, poised to still seize the, the opportunity to take on what they strongly believe is a declining America, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, the risk of conflict cannot be dismissed. Yeah, very timely book, Stephen. Thank you so much for joining us. We do appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Always great to get his perspective. Stephen Roach of Yale. You better get a plan B in order. Uh, Jeff Mills, are there U.S. companies where you think, you know what, there is a plan B. Starbucks will have a plan B, and Nike will have a plan B. And you know what, you, you look through this. Yeah, I mean, I think the good news here is that we didn't necessarily learn anything uh, over the party Congress period that we didn't know already, right? So I would think these companies, the Starbucks, the Apples, these companies that have exposure there, that have growth plans there, you know, there is a plan B in place. We did not have some watershed moment where all of a sudden these companies say, wow, oh my goodness, the landscape has shifted. I think it just solidifies what they already know. So I, I think that that's the very good news about all of this. Um, and maybe the last thing I'll say, just in terms of where there might be opportunity, uh, you know, heading into an economic slowdown, you might not think about small caps. I've mentioned small caps on the show before. But in this particular situation, uh, the lower percentage of revenues in China, you know, some of these things make these companies very attractive uh, at a period of the economic cycle where they might not usually be so.
Yeah, and I'll just say this. I mean, think about, you know, we started with a trade war years ago. Um, that was the start of some of the inflationary pressures. We started thinking about reshoring jobs here. If wage inflation is one of the stickiest parts about it, and just think about, you know, a company like Apple is very different than a company like Starbucks in China. They rely on Chinese citizens for manufacturing, for cheap manufacturing. So they're already starting to think about what other places in Asia or in the Western Hemisphere where they can do that. That's just expensive here. And I can just go back to that first week of January of 2019, Apple had one of its first negative pre-announcements for a quarter in, I think, over 10 years. And it was based on China and fears of a slowdown on China. So going back to what Guy is talking about, they've done a lot of really good things in a difficult environment managing throughout this entire pandemic. But I just would be shocked if we get to Thursday night and China is not a huge focus from both a manufacturing standpoint and a demand standpoint.